these questions lead us on to the second large question we have to be asking ourselves. Why study Islam? Is it really worth it? Well, obviously, if you've chosen to attend this course, you've already formulated your own answer to that question. But let me just try and list some reasons, just in case, for instance, you have kids who are not um, particularly motivated to, to study it. The most obvious reason is that Islam is quite simply a major fact of world history. In fact, although it's not sufficiently acknowledged, between, say, the 8th and the 16th century, Islam was the dominant civilization on the planet. Dominant in the sense of its demography, of its economic prowess, of its cultural productivity, and also of its universal character. China and India obviously also developed great civilizations at that time, but they were limited within a particular geographical area, whereas Islam was a great sprawling civilization. Christendom, for that period, was confined essentially to the small European appendage to the old world, while Islam's political orbit embraced a truly gigantic swathe of the planet. Half of Africa, the Middle East, um, the Indian Ocean, India itself, Central Asia and Indonesia. Islam, in short, was the great success story of the Middle Ages. Christians, when they interacted with Muslims politically, invariably found themselves up against more powerful, very redoubtable, often palpably and embarrassingly more civilized Muslim neighbors. From Christian Europe, if you went south, you would come to Muslim Spain, whose population in the 11th century was actually greater than all of Christian Europe put together. The biggest city in Europe was Cordoba, under the Muslims, which had over a million inhabitants, at a time when the largest Christian city in Europe, Paris, had barely 60,000. Um, to the southeast of Europe, there was, of course, the Middle East itself, and in due season, the very alarming Ottoman presence in the Balkans. It's easy to forget that only 300 years ago, the city of Budapest was a flourishing Muslim city. To the east, um, where nowadays um, one generally encounters um, parts of Russia, there were, again, powerful, flourishing Muslim states, those referred to by European historians as the Tatar Khanates, um, the Volga Bulgars, and the Golden Horde. And again, these were far more flourishing in their civilization than their Christian neighbors. Moscow was a fairly small city. Kazan, the great Muslim city on, on the Volga, was a, a great center of, of culture, civilization, etc. So Christendom was more or less encircled, and the only way it could go, of course, was west, which is one reason, of course, why it did just that. <clears throat> so that's one reason why Islam is certainly worth studying. It's of more historical importance to Europeans and to Christians than is any other civilization. Secondly, Islam is of intellectual interest. It's particularly interesting because, like Christianity, <coughs> it sprang from the same Semitic soil, and it also allowed its dogmas to be shaped by the same categories of Greek philosophy. In fact, Islam is, for these two reasons, more closely related to Christianity than is any other religion, not accepting Judaism. And by seeing how the universal issues and problems raised by the premises of, of Semitic monotheism, questions of metaphysics, styles of worship, problems about the existence of evil in the world, for instance, mysticism, by looking at how these universal problems were addressed by Muslim thinkers, Christians have historically often found that they can acquire valuable insights and perspectives on their own tradition. This is a very long time honored process of intellectual dialogue that we find, for instance, um, at its most prominent in the European Middle Ages uh, with people like uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, unquestionably the most brilliant medieval European mind. And in his great work, the Summa Theologica, he refers to two individuals more frequently than anybody else. He talks about the philosopher, by whom he means Aristotle, and he talks about the commentator, by whom he means Averroes, who was, in Arabic, Ibn Rushd, the great, pious, Maliki judge and philosopher of Muslim Cordoba. And there are many aspects of Averroes' um, philosophy which found their place in the mainstream of medieval Christian thought. So in both of these ways, in terms of political history and intellectual history, Islam inhabits the world of Western Christianity. There has been a genuine overlap. Now this takes us on to the third reason why Islam is worth studying. Islam is a major fact of today's world, merely in demographic terms. 
At least 62 states now have Muslim majorities, and these include some of the world's most populous countries. The world's fourth most populous country, Indonesia, is a Muslim country with over 200 million Muslims. Other very populous Muslim countries obviously include places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Egypt, etc. Although no statistics, um, especially in this area, should be trusted, um, generally it's assumed that around 1.2 billion human beings today follow the religion of Islam. Hence it's Christianity's nearest numerical rival. Now what's even more striking is that largely because Muslims are the inhabitants of the impoverished third world, this figure is growing rapidly. And demography is one of the great determining uh, facts of the world's cultural and, and political history. According to one set of figures, um, specifically those set out, I think, um, on the basis of some very solid research in something called the Oxford Encyclopedia of World Religions, at the beginning of the present century, the Muslims represented about 12% of the world's population. In 1985, the figure had jumped to 17.1%. By the year 2000, the figure will have reached 19.2%, which is a quite extraordinary rate of proportional increase of around 2.1% in only 15 years, pr compared with a uh, projected growth for Christianity of only 0.1%. Um, nor is this rapid growth, of course, confined to majoritarian Muslim countries. No fewer than 38% of the world's Muslims live as minorities. China is home to perhaps 40 million Muslims. India contains well over 100 million Muslims. There are now thriving Muslim communities in countries like Japan and Korea, which 100 years ago quite possibly didn't contain a single Muslim. In the West, too, the Muslim presence is growing very rapidly, through, largely through natural increase, but also, particularly in places like um, America and Australia, through immigration and through conversion. In Europe, um, we have more or less slammed the door in the face of, of new migration, but it, it continues in America and, and, and Australia. We are told that the Muslim population of the United States has jumped sixfold since 1970. Perhaps 15 million Americans are Muslims, including perhaps four or five million African Americans. Um, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and now the generally regrettable figure of Mike Tyson are reminders <laughs> of the continuing vitality and growth of this, what is now a major American religion. Last year, President Clinton held first ever end of Ramadan celebrations in the White House. In Europe, Islam is the second religion of almost every country, the only exceptions being those countries where it is the majority religion, places like Albania and Azerbaijan, for instance. According to one researcher, 10.3% of the population of Moscow is now Muslim. The other end of the continent, in England, we have towns such as Rochdale, where the majority of the population is now Muslim. There are perhaps five million Muslims in France. But astonishing as this might seem, demographic growth um, and the associated political and cultural backlashes, which it's already generating, particularly in Europe, um, is not the most remarkable aspect of modern Islamic history. Everybody knows that this religion is at present experiencing a vast transformation uh, revival, according to some people, or uh, according to others, uh, lamentable descent into medievalist obscurantism, fanaticism and heresy. This huge force is now shaking every single Muslim country, without exception, um, threatening the pro-Western secular order in countries like Algeria, Egypt and Turkey, and also having repercussions of quite a significant kind for Muslim communities living in the West. Now, this present-day Muslim resurgence has to be seen as one of the great facts of late 20th century history. With the death of communism, Islam can be seen as the last great, significant, transnational ideology which competes with Western capitalism, however we define that. That's not to negate the importance of Christianity. It's simply to point out that Christianity's political and economic impact is in Christian countries far less significant than is Islam's equivalent impact in Muslim lands. A re-Christianization of a Christian country does not have such far-reaching implications as the re-Islamization of a Muslim country for the obvious reason that Islam includes things like law, which generally are excluded from the traditional concerns of Christian belief. 
Now, it's true, of course, that this thing we call Islamic fundamentalism, this is the term, by the way, which um, is an example of how we should not illegitimately import um, foreign vocabulary into Islamic discourse. It's a journalistic term that scholars do try to avoid. Um, this thing can be seen as part of a more general global um, revival, which is gripping all religions to some extent. In America, you have things like uh, dear old Jerry Falwell's moral majority. Um, in India, you have Hindu revivalist movements um, such as the Shiv Sena, now achieving considerable political power. But the Muslim modality of this general late 20th century transformation seems to many observers to be more powerful, more successfully transnational, and also more deeply transformative of the cultures in which it appears. And it's clear that the future good order of the world, and certainly the shape of history in the next century, is going to be determined in large measure by the way in which the Muslims themselves develop and exploit for good purposes this, this development, and also on the reaction that the Western powers are going to have towards it. It's a major determining fact of, of, of contemporary um, realities. Anyway, that's the end of the first introductory two parts of this lecture. Um, I've tried, first of all, to outline the kind of questions we ask about religions we're not familiar with. And I've also set out some of the reasons why Islam is certainly deserving of serious um, attention. Um, and one reason why I've done this is to try and convince you that Islam is not just another dry academic discipline on the curriculum, but an, uh, an unusually fascinating um, a topic which is of central importance to today's world.